Hey everybody, this is Kyle Bodie with Driveline Baseball. Uh, today I want to talk a little bit about some advanced pitching mechanics, specifically um, pronation and pronating your curveball. Uh, this video is not um, not going to talk about your basic pitching mechanics, your stuff you can learn from a book or anything stupid like that. If you need to learn about uh, drop and drive, tall and fall, or stride length, or stride speed, or force vector, or any of that stuff, I highly recommend you pick up some books on the topic. Today we're going to be going into deep detail. Uh, you'll probably need a copy of Gray's Anatomy or something like that to really discuss the kinesiological effects here. Um, it's not really meant to be a beginner's thing, but um, it's a follow-up to Trevor Bauer's um, video where he discussed his pitch design. And I, what I thought he did a very good job of is uh, illustrating the arm path, and um, he talked a little bit about it, and I wanted to go into more detail for the guys that wanted a really scientific, deep look into it. So that's kind of the genesis of that. So, a little bit about me is that uh, I'm the owner of Driveline Baseball in Seattle, Washington. Uh, we're now in Puyallup. Uh, we have several hundred clients, past and present, um, you know, high school, college, pro, a couple young kids as well. Uh, that picture is of Trevor on the left, Jack McGeary, second from the left, me, uh, and then Ryan Chapman. It's not too hard to figure out who's not the professional athlete there. Um, yeah. So some thoughts on pronation. So what is pronation? Um, really all it is is turning the thumb down. So thinking about taking your pitching hand uh, and turning the thumb down and rotating the forearm um, in such a way immediately towards the body. Now the issue is that that's not really what it is when it comes to pitching. You know, it's not that simple. You know, it's not a single joint exercise or a single joint movement. Although, you know, medically that's exactly what it is. Um, it's inexorably linked to internal rotation and we'll get into that in a little bit. I was first brought to the forefront by Dr. Mike Marshall, who won the Cy Young with the Dodgers. You may remember he has some awesome relief pitching records that will never be broken. Um, he's also kind of a crazy pitching theorist. Um, you know, his theories were that pronation would help create a gap in the elbow, um, would help engage the muscles of the medial forearm and protect the ulnar collateral ligament, and it would also um, reduce the amount of uh, collisions with the, ulna <coughs> with the ulna and the olecranon fossa, so it would reduce um, hyaline cartilage fractures um, and ulnar, ulnar fractures, uh, bone chips, that kind of stuff. Stuff that you might go see Dr. Kremchak for. Um, it turns out that he's actually, you know, there's a lot of peer-reviewed research that shows he's probably pretty correct in those. Um, and that was 30 years ago. He was basically guessing while looking at high-speed video. Uh, so it's actually pretty impressive. So uh, how much do we believe in it and how much do we teach, how do we teach it? So that's a, a picture from a video of someone using 10-pound wrist weights on their hand to train the hand driving over the elbow, which is a great cue from Chris Holt, um, so thanks for that, Chris, and learning how to engage uh, pronation and internal rotation. So, like I said before, pronation is not simply turning the thumb down. It is um, inexorably linked to the shoulder. And so the elbow and shoulder are married. It's a good way to think about it. So supination, you know, giving someone a thumbs up, it allows for ideal external rotation. And external rotation is simply that high cock position, the arm is laying back. <clears throat> That's, you know, what external rotation is of the shoulder. Uh, and internal rotation drives pronation. And so it, what's important to understand here is that ideal external rotation and scapular tilt um, and everything that allows the arm to lay back is inexorably linked to supination. And so as we internally rotate from a fully maximally supinated position, we get a, a fair amount of pronation as a result of the unwinding due to internal rotation. Uh, a great resource on this is um, is just the, the word torque and understanding the drive. Uh, and Dr. Kelly Sturette talks a lot about it in uh, Becoming a Supple Leopard, which is a book that I didn't buy based on the title alone for a lot for a long time. And that was a mistake. Dr. Sturette's book is excellent and talks, although it has nothing to do with baseball, it talks a lot about creating torque and understanding that externally rotated, supinated position being a, a position of power um, and, and one that we want to initiate movement from and not end up in. Um, the most commonly taught curveball or slider involves you know, supinating through release or turning the doorknob or pulling the lampshade down or karate chopping the ball. And if your pitching coach tells you this, he's stupid and doesn't understand that that's really not the way that you should be throwing breaking pitches. Um, or, or you can throw it that way, but it actually limits the amount of rotation you get on it, which sets a ceiling on the amount of break, and it also is uh, you know, pretty unhealthy on the elbow. Um, so this kind of ties into the adequate coaching. So anyone can say just look like Greg Maddox. That's not very helpful. And that's basically what most people do when they say, uh, you know, they take video 
of you and, um, you know, the advanced guys will take video of you and put it next to Greg Maddox or Tim Lincecum or Roger Clemens or whoever they want. And they'll say, oh, you need to get closer to Greg Maddox, you need to get closer to Roger Clemens, you need to get closer to Lincecum or whatever, and here's what he does and here's what you do and here's how you can get closer. So that's about the uh, the most useful advice you can get from a traditional pitching coach. You know, most people aren't even that advanced. But the problem is, is that you aren't Greg Maddox and you're not Tim Lincecum. And so trying to get movement in the same way that they do, trying to, you know, even from a video perspective is, is very misleading because from a kinesiological aspect, your muscles fire different than theirs, your anatomical structure is different than theirs. And so what you need to do is figure out how to engage the muscles like they do um, and to create a similar mapping situation to give, you know, hopefully the, the command of Greg Maddox with the velocity of, you know, the University of Washington version of Tim Lincecum. I mean, that would be a, that would be a pretty good picture. Um, and so you have to understand that training external rotation plus supination into internal rotation plus pronation is not a singular thing. It's not one of these things that's very easy to do. Um, it's, it's, it requires a multimodal training effect. And any pitching coach that tells you it's simple or, you know, the common criticism of Trevor is he overthinks things. Well, uh, pitching is actually pretty pretty complicated. It's not one of these things where it's just like, oh, you got to find a target and you throw strikes and yada yada. Well, if it was that easy, we'd all throw 90 miles an hour and we'd all throw strikes. The problem is it's not that easy. So let's get over the fact that it's hard and let's kind of look into that and embrace the challenge. So Trevor's had some command issues. There's no secret about that. Uh, in 2013, we started working together in the midway part of the season. Um, his postural shift had altered the axis of rotation of all of his pitches. Basically what happened is he switched the posture um, from a, um, from a upright posture or a um, big spinal tilt posture, like a Lincecum-esque uh, posture, to Chris Young, Josh Coleman's type um, posture to a more of a classic posture. Um, this isn't bad or good. It's just a decision that he decided to make um, for reasons that aren't worth discussing here. Um, and... Unfortunately, you know, that changes um, how you apply force to the baseball, um, or you know, it destroys your feel, basically. And so you can see at the bottom those pitch effects graphs from TexasLeaguers.com. You can see on the left is 2012, and on the right is 2013. And so Trevor always has two different clusters of pitches, because that's he pitches off both sides of the mound, depending on the pitches he throws, and depends on the hitters. For more information on that, you should really check out Perry Husband's Effective Velocity. Um, stuff, hitting as a guest.com. Um, but the problem is, is that Trevor knew that he made this change, but he didn't make an adjustment. So pitches just don't do what they think you're going to do. So, you know, if you look at Trevor's UCLA stats, um, or stats really, you know, before he's had these issues, command is really not a problem for him, and it never has been. Um, so it's not one of these things where he's just, you know, he hasn't figured it out or whatever. It's just that um, when you do the same thing, and apply force to the baseball that you always have over the past few years, yet you've changed one major thing. It's um, it's going to cause, you know, bad command, you can't throw strikes, yada, 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 even though it feels exactly the same way. So command is not what you think it is. It's not focus on a, a target and you throw to it and yada, yada, yada. No, it's command is way more complicated than that. It's not, it's not simple. Again, baseball is not simple, and pitching and throwing 95 and spotting it up is not simple, so... It's a lot more complicated than that. I'm not going to get into too much of that, um, but we'll talk a little bit more about it going on. Okay, so this is Trevor's pull versus drive curveball. So in 2013, he shifted his posture away from that picture that you see at UCLA. Um, and you see he's pre-setting his karate chop motion. That's the curveball that he threw at UCLA. It's a great effect. Um, but the problem is, is when he flattened out his posture, it, it causes him to pull his curveball almost like a slider, or like a really bad cutter. Um, it's what I immediately noticed when I looked at his AAA footage um, online. So how did, how did we fix it? Okay, so we used wrist weights to help remap that arm path um, and it really helped him understand the marriage of, again, external rotation plus maximal supination to internal rotation plus pronation. Um, what Trevor was taught is that, you know, you set the arm, you preset it, and then you, of course, you're going to pronate after release or through release. Um, from a neutral hand position. You'll see his hand is in a neutral position. It looks like it's supinated, but in reality it's, um, I mean, it is supinated with the thumb up, but it's not maximally supinated. Um, it, it's from a neutral position and pronate after the pitch. And that's that's not, um, if he wants the maximum amount of rotation, that's not exactly uh, the best way to go about it. The best way to go about it is to think about driving the back of the hand to the plate uh, from an occipital way of thinking about a straight path to the plate. Uh, with flexion in the elbow, and you'll see Trevor has flexion in the elbow um, 
as a result of being taught some of the drills that Ron Wolforth teaches at the Texas Baseball Ranch. And that's a great way to achieve that um, straight drive line to the plate. Um, and so then the difference was night and day after we worked together when he came to Seattle and we trained. Um, he really had a good feel for the, um, the drills that we do. Um, and using the overload, underload implements, um, primarily the underload or the overload implements, understanding how to use the two and four pound balls to get that feel, um, the, the glove separation, the scapular separation, um, how to avoid the concept of um, glove blocking, um, which is another just like a Tom House MPA teach that's just totally counterproductive. Um, how to get away from the concept of equal and opposite, which is another not useful uh, cue in my opinion. And um, the curveball now, he worked, you know, over two months on this, and um, you can go see his video, but I've cut the curveball video so you can see it, and that's a pretty darn good curveball. Um, it's got significantly more drop. If you compare his curveball online, you can check YouTube. He's uploaded 420 frames per second video of his um, the release, and it's significantly different than it is now, and it's just a testament to how hard he's worked on this. And you could see, that even from 30 frames per second here, you can see that the arm path is a very occipital-driven, straight-to-the-plate um, pitch, um, and it's just got massive break, and it's just a great curveball. Um, it's, it's very exciting. And so it's understanding that unwinding of the arm again. So some people have posited that unwinding the arm from external to internal rotation uh, and supination and pronation is natural. Well, my rebuttal to that is getting e eaten by lines is natural. I mean, that's not, a, that's not a reasonable argument that this is natural, that pitchers do this, that this is something you see in all pitchers. Because I'll tell you what, there's plenty of 11-year-old pitchers who do not pronate through release. Um, and there's plenty of just people who throw that don't pronate through release. I mean, it happens all the time. You see it all the time if you're looking for it. Yeah, guys who throw 95 or Clemens or whatever, they all pronate after release, but they're, they're evaluating this based on 25 or 30 frames per second video and not really understanding the kinesiological effect of actual pronation rather than this passive pronation and then the arm is slowing down. Of course, everybody pronates after release. That's the whole point. The, the pronator teres and the pronator quadratus are there to slow the arm down. So, yeah, obviously that happens, but that's totally missing the boat on what's actually happening. So this is the 1,000 frames per second video that Trevor shot, and it's, you, can un, you can really see that he's pointing the middle knuckle basically to the plate in the first couple frames of the, of the shot, and he's just getting massive, massive, um, just an excellent arm path. You know, he's, his, his forearm is almost inside vertical. You know, he's driving the, driving the arm to the plate, and he has massive pronation after release. Um, it's just an excellent job, um, and really a testament to remapping this. Uh, he says from the drills that we do, he's able to get, um, even better um, supination to pronation unwinding, and um, I look forward to seeing that. But uh, this is a pretty pretty darn good effort right here. Um, so active versus pro passive pronation. So active pronation is generally just not not a good idea, right? It, it runs contrary to Dr. Marshall's ideas, where you want to turn the hand over intentionally. Um, but really, all that's doing is it's engaging the pronator teres, the pronator quadratus, and the flexor digitorum superficialis. And it's a great way to slow the arm down prematurely. So if you want to throw 80 miles an hour, it's, it's great. It works great. Um, you're contracting the medial forearm bundle, so the pronator flexor mass, and that really inhibits forearm layback. So if you do it out of sequence, you're going to get uh, really poor dynamic external rotation, and that's not, that's not what we want. Uh, but then again, passive pronation isn't correct either. That's the pronation is natural you know, garbage, you know, just like king cobras are natural, but I don't see people jumping into pits with king cobras either. Um, you know, the ideal pattern is somewhere in the middle. It requires a really strong medial forearm bundle um, built with wrist weights, overload implements, and, and a map that goes with it. Um, and a smart, you know, smart motor units that fire properly. It's kind of like the rotator cuff. You don't want a, you know, a bulky rotator cuff if such a thing exists. You want a rotator cuff that fires intelligently and, and keeps the glenohumeral socket all together. Um, and so you want both. You want it to be strong and smart. Uh, and it requires a good understanding of the arm path, and, and that's built through overload implements and understanding uh, a mapping of the arm. Um, so accipital versus centripetal, I've said this a little bit. So accipital is acceleration towards the center of the target, whereas centripetal is acceleration towards the center of the origin. And so centripetal would be something like uh, an extreme sidearm pitcher who releases the ball um, in line with their head, essentially. And so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of stress being applied perpendicular to the line of axis or perpendicular to the line of force, um, whereas, you know, an accipital, a pure accipital delivery is, in theory, what Dr. Marshall's clients do, but actually don't. Um, a pure accipital delivery is almost like Josh Coleman's, or of the, of the Diamondbacks, um, the, the straight-over-the-top um, 
uh, straight path uh, that's thrown to the target rather than acceleration towards the center of the origin. Um, the better the arm is driven in an occipital fashion, there's less stress on the arm. Um, it's just a, I had a long conversation with Dr. Murray Maitland of the University of Washington who, who discussed this quite a bit, actually. And it's understanding, you know, if you were to build a, a machine to throw baseballs um, at 90 miles an hour and for strikes, what would it look like? Oh, well, it turns out they've already built that machine and it looks like an iron mic, right? And the iron mic is a perfect example of a lever um, being, you know, applying force in a straight line to the plate um, and, you know, consistently throwing strikes. Um, now, the issue is that, you know, our body can't look like that, so that's not, that's out of the question, but something along that line is, is an idea, you know, we're trying to get to, you know, that idea, um, so much about biomechanics, we get wrapped up in the, the prefix of it, which is bio, and, and not enough about the mechanics, about the physics of it, you know, a mechanical engineer could, you know, can really understand a lot about pitching without knowing a, a, th- a single thing about baseball, just by understanding how levers, pulleys, and so forth work, um, and so, you know, the arm should be unwinding optimally and it, it best engages the dual spine engine. I've talked about it in some blog posts and stuff. Um, the, the two things that are majorly contributing to the fastball velocity, aside from internal rotation and elbow extension, which are to a degree not teachable, is um, for, is uh, trunk flexion and trunk rotation. And so understanding that there's, you know, two engines going forward where it's the, the further and faster we can flex the trunk to the plate, and the further and faster we can rotate around the spine and the trunk, you know, the harder we throw the ball. Um, and so that's, you know, the arm unwinding in that path on the right and the right time is what we're looking for. Um, additionally, we want, you know, some elbow flexion gapping. Dr. Sturrett talks a little bit about this in his book, even though it has nothing to do with baseball. And forward rotation, you know, Will Forth clients may understand this as late launch. Um, and Marshall clients, you know, I think they call it forward rotation as well. Um, the, the better you can release the ball closer to the target, like a David Robertson situation with elite forward rotation, um, is better. Uh, peer-reviewed research actually can be found on this. I'm not just making this all up or, or theoretically um, talking about it. You can find you know, Dr. Arnell, or Arnell Aguinaldo's work out of the San Diego Motion Analysis Lab, where there's a lot of uh, research on how elbow flexion at release is positively correlated with a reduction of elbow valgus stress, how... Sidearm pitchers or a late uh, early trunk rotation onset is uh, positively correlated with elbow valgus stress, um, and so actually there's some you know there's some peer-reviewed research for people who are actually interested in this. I would look up his papers. Um, I got to give credit to Lon Fulmer for the terminology of occipital versus centripetal, um, and uh, def- you can definitely look him up as well. He's got some interesting stuff online. Um, so the conclusion is that, you know, this isn't supposed to be simple. This video is supposed to be pretty complicated, but it's supposed to be a, a high-level overview of some of the complicated concepts of what we deal with in pitching. Again, if you want something simple, you know, it's like, oh, wow, well, you just got to, you know, extend the back leg and you need to do this and, you know, just do this and it'll be fine, then there's plenty of videos for that. Uh, but our company is, you know, our research has always been based on, you know, what's actually happening in the delivery, how do we train it, um, and, and, you know, it's, it's for the people who are interested in the nitty-gritty of it. Um, but the point is is that your coaches should be able to understand these theories and they should be able to monitor them. Um, for example, I'm not going to talk to any of my 11U kids or 14U kids about flexion gapping and forward rotation and, uh, you know, occipital versus centripetal. It's just silly, obviously. The, the point is to distill these concepts into a basic understanding um, that you can give to kids. Um, so high-speed video is mandatory. If, you're, if your pitching coach doesn't have a high-speed video camera, just get a new one. I mean, the high-speed cameras are available for 200 bucks on Amazon. It's totally worth the investment. Um, there's, that's all I'm going to say about that. We have 11 high-speed cameras, and we're always adding more. Um, EMG sensors for muscle activity, they're not a bad investment. You know, we're starting to get into that. We purchased a kit from Symaxis. I was an early investor a year and a half ago, and um, it's, it's, it's going to be a really useful tool because you can measure you know, the kinesiology of what's happening rather than just the biomechanics. You understand that the medial forearm is, is firing here, the lat fires here, and I'll, I'll stop rambling on that, but it's definitely something to consider purchasing if you're a coach. Um, i got to give a plug. Some of these concepts are in the dynamic picture. I wrote a book um, called The Dynamic Picture with a ton of videos, and it's about training uh, youth athletes from 8-year-olds to, you know, 14-year-olds and, and so forth. A lot of it is um, a lot of it's based on what we do already, but um, I, I've done a lot of research, and there's just not really a good book on youth pitching um, and that actually discusses training and how to throw strikes and 
you know, arm care and, and really understanding it from a, a base level. So The Dynamic Pitcher is a great book. I think it's a great series. I've been working on it. I worked on it for a couple of years. It's at uh, www.thedynamicpitcher.com. Um, it's pretty good. I like it. Uh, I'll, I'm not a little biased, I guess. Uh, some more advanced stuff. If you like this stuff, it's going to come out in my Velocity book and video set. I don't have a firm release date on that, unfortunately. Um, I'm always constantly learning, you know, and so I want to make sure that the product is, is good to go. Um, I anticipate it'll be released sometime in 2014, I would assume, for the off-season uh, training, although I'm shooting for a summer release date, so we'll see. So anyway, my name's Kyle Bode in Driveline Baseball. You can come see us in our lab in Seattle. It's actually in Puyallup, Washington. Um, we'd love to have you there. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the comments, and I'll respond as best I can. Thanks.